2016 was a difficult year for Europe. The continent strained to absorb near record numbers of immigrants arriving from the Middle East and Africa. Also, Britain voted to exit the European Union, and a new populist movement is threatening to bring more of the same brand of political change as we've seen here with the election of Donald Trump. We sat with the EU ambassador to the U.S., David O'Sullivan, and began the conversation with immigration. On the immigration situation in the U.K. and in Europe, when we hear things reported in the United States, I think there are two views. One of them is the, the gates have been opened and have welcomed people who are in desperate conditions, and it's added a great deal of diversity to the EU, and it's been a wonderful thing. On the other hand, I think there's a view that people are running amok. There are increases in crime because of this, and people are endangered. What's the truth? Well, I think it's much more the, the former and much less the latter. I mean, I, I think there have been relatively few incidences of violence or, or of, of, of civil, civil unrest. But it is true that this crisis has challenged European society simply by virtue of the numbers of people involved. But at the same time, there was nervousness, there was fear. There were 65 million displaced people globally. Were all of them going to come to Europe? Were we going to be able to manage this? And I think that's been the challenge. And I think, frankly, we have now managed it. I think we have brought the situation under greater control. Does Europe now have a policy that says what happens and how to keep this from being something that overwhelms the entire continent? Yes, I think we do. Nearly nine out of ten of the people arriving at our frontiers, in one way or another, have paid or been aided and abetted by a smuggler's network. And this is a human tragedy in many ways. People giving their life savings sometimes to be put on leaky vessels and risk their lives. So dealing with the smugglers is a very important part of what we're doing, but also saving lives. And I know we have tragically lost nearly 4,000 people in the Mediterranean this year. We have rescued nearly 400,000 people. Can you give me just one example of how you were able to take 10,000 refugees a day coming in from Turkey to Greece and get that down to about 100. We offered very substantial funds to Turkey to, to assist with the refugees they had in, in Turkey. Turkey is hosting about 3 million refugees. And we have promised them in a first phase 3 billion euros, in a second phase a further 3 billion. So that's 6 billion euros. Not a gift to the Turkish government, but to provide facilities for the refugees in Turkey. So to create the best conditions possible for those refugees living in Turkey on a temporary basis, obviously hoping that when the situation in Syria gets better, they will return. Secondly, uh, we ag agreed that any uh, people arriving illegally in, in Europe, and in particular in Greece, would be returned to Turkey. So we, we blocked the incentive of the smugglers to say to people, oh, once we get you to Europe, you're OK, then you'll go on to Germany. As I hear you talk, I'm thinking about our southern border. It could be applied, many of the same concerns Indeed. and questions could be applied. What could we take from what Europe has already tried to implement in protecting its own situation? Perhaps the biggest difference in the United States, or between the United States and Europe, is that we were dealing with people coming as asylum seekers and, ref and refugees fleeing conflict and with legal entitlement. This, of course, meant that you could not simply turn them away. It was not a question of, of saying, take a number and uh, fill in a form and come back and we'll, we'll, we'll contact you. Uh, you had to take these people in. Uh, and that put huge pressure uh, on our member states. Um, we are now, I think, reducing that pressure. Do you see any similarities between the Brexit vote in the UK and the Donald Trump vote here in the United States? And are there any lessons there? I think, yes, there is a general problem in the Western world of a certain disillusion amongst the electorate with the establishment, with established politics. We see this a lot uh, in Europe, uh, not just in the UK with the Brexit vote, but we've seen it uh, in other countries. And I think that may have been an element here in the United States. Is this the beginning of a big sea change or Europe falling apart as a union? I don't think we're falling apart at all. Uh, we were very disappointed by the vote in the UK. I, I won't hide from you the fact that uh, we were saddened at, at that decision of the British people that they want to leave the European Union. We respect it. It's a, a democratic decision. Uh, we think it will have damaging consequences for the UK, for the rest of us. But of course, this is the decision, and we will now work our way through this to try and find uh, the, the 
the least damaging way of doing this. So people are often very critical of the European Union, I grant you. Uh, I like to say sometimes that Brussels is held in about as much respect in the rest of Europe as Washington sometimes is in the rest of the United States. People like to groan, but people also understand it brings many benefits. And I think it's one thing to complain, it's another thing to say they'd like to leave, and I, I don't think any other country is going to follow that route anytime soon. So five years from now, you think all the countries remaining in the EU are still there? I'm absolutely certain that will be the case. Worth noting, the EU's two most important and powerful members, France and Germany, will both be holding general elections next year. In France in particular, right-wing or populist politicians are expected to do well.